This morning, I want to talk to you about shouting glory in the temple. Shouting glory in the temple. Psalm 29, please, if you go there. And you may want to put a marker in Psalm 40 and also Psalm 18. Now, Father, I thank you, God, with all my heart. I praise you. I bless you, Jesus, for the victory we have in Christ. Thank you, God, for what you won for us. Thank you, Lord, for the promises that you've given to us. And your word tells us that by these promises that we become partakers of the divine life of God within us. And so thank you, Lord, for what you're going to speak this morning, this afternoon, this evening. Thank you, God, that you are building us as your people for this hour in which we live. I yield my body to you, God, and I ask you to speak through me. Give encouragement to every heart of every person that's here this morning. Father, I thank you and I praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I, I have a sense for a lot it's been a hard week. Let me see your hands. You had a hard week? Let me see your hand. All right. Well, you've come to the right place. I don't know if it's possible to live in New York and not have a hard week. It's a tough city, especially at this time we're living in now. But I'm going to promise you, if you'll hear this, that you'll shout glory. By the time this message is done, you'll shout glory. Even if you're shouting it by faith, you'll shout glory. Praise God. Psalm 29, a psalm of King David. Give unto the Lord, O you mighty ones. Obviously, that's to you this morning. Amen. Give unto the Lord glory and strength. Give unto the Lord the glory due to his name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The God of glory thunders. The Lord is over many waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. Yes, the Lord splinters the cedars of Lebanon. He makes them also skip like, a, skip like a calf, Lebanon and Syrian, like a young wild ox. The voice of the Lord divides the flames of fire. The voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness. The Lord shakes the wilderness of Kadesh. The, Lord, the voice of the Lord makes the deer give birth and strips the forest bare. And in his temple, everyone, says glory. And I like the King James because I believe it says shout in the King James. In his temple, everyone, 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 no exceptions. In his temple, those who know who he is, those who have been listening to his voice, those who have been letting him be God, everyone shouts glory, everyone in the temple of God. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. That means you. You might have come in here this morning shouting, oh, woe is me. You might have got up this morning and said, oh, God, another day. You might have headed out for church only to run into this corn maze outside in the streets trying to get to the house of God. And you say, what else can go wrong? But you come to the house of the Lord, and I tell you, God will never fail you. God will never fail you. In his temple, everyone says glory. Now his temple, we are the temple of the Holy Spirit now. And so if I have the living Christ inside of me, there's a shout and I wanna explain why it's not just a word that we say. There's something behind this word. There's something that causes us to come into the presence of God and not just when we meet corporately on Sunday or Tuesday or whatever day, but when we get up and we're all alone in the morning, there's something in this temple that allows us to shout glory as we begin our day. There's something inside this temple that lets us shout glory when the day is over, whether it's been a good day or a bad day. It doesn't change who God is inside of us. The Lord, verse 10 in Psalm 29, sat enthroned at the flood. The Lord sits as king forever. The Lord will give strength to his people. The Lord will bless his people with peace. Now this psalm is about worship. It's about a kind of worship that when people witness it, especially people who are outside of the kingdom of God, this worship convinces them of the reality of God. David, the king again in Psalm 40, talks about it. He describes it beginning at verse one. He says, I waited patiently for the Lord and he inclined to me. 
and he heard my cry and he brought me up out of a horrible pit. In other words, a place I couldn't get out in my own strength. I don't know how to get out. I've been in it so long, I've given up hope of even getting out in my own strength. It can be an issue of character. It can be something deeply entrenched in your life. It can be something that produces sorrow in your heart because you don't know how you're ever gonna get out. Will this ever change? Will I ever know this new life and this abundant life in this area of my heart that God has promised me? Will it ever, will it ever come? And that's a legitimate question that comes to the honest seeker of God. You're not some kind of an aberration because that question is in your heart today. If you're a sincere seeker of God, some things will change easy. You know, there, when you come into the kingdom of God, there, there'll be things in your life that, that, that pass away almost immediately. You know, the scripture says, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation, the old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And there are just some things that, that go easy. But then there's other things. They've just been there so long and they've been there, they were there in your grandpa, they were there in your dad or mom, and now they're there in you. And you're just saying, God, how do I get out of this? How do I get over this bad temper? How do I escape this, this constant gnawing at my inner person that, that I'll never be free from these things? It says, he brought me up out of a horrible pit, not just a pit, a horrible pit. Out of the miry clay, out of a place, David says, where I was sinking deeper every day. I was getting more discouraged because I just didn't see the victory coming my way. And I kept feeling every day like it's not getting better, it's getting worse. And he set my feet upon a rock and he established my steps and put a new song in my mouth. Praise to our God. Many shall see it and fear and trust in the Lord. He put a new song in me, not the old song, not a song of human effort, a song of confidence in who God is and what God has done, what God will do, what God will continue to do, a song of glorious praise to him. And the song, as I've often shared from this pulpit, is deeper than a melody. It's in your countenance. It's something inside of you as a believer in Jesus Christ. When you've come to the place where you've won a victory that you know only God could have given you. Hallelujah. Some people think that if we clap our hands louder, we sing at the top of our voices. If we run up and down the aisles of the church, if we wave flags, banners, and ribbons, if we put on a wonderful light show, if we sway, swoon, bang, clang, shake, and sweat, that this is going to glorify Christ and compel people to surrender to him. And I've seen all of it, folks, over the years. I've seen the ribbons, flags, banners, bangs, clang, swoon, sweat, run. I've watched it all. And I've watched our young people. And I've watched people outside the kingdom of God. Just look at it, unmoved, unchallenged, unchanged, no trembling in the heart. Because what we are doing sometimes when we do these things, they could do. If they decided they could do it. The Bible's not talking about that kind of worship. The Bible's talking about a kind of a worship in the house of God that they can't do. That only those who are redeemed can really do this kind of worship. In Psalm 40, verse four, David says, blessed is the man who makes the Lord his trust and does not respect the proud nor such as turn aside to lies. And here's what David's saying. This is a kind of a worship that has turned away from human strategy. It's turned away from human effort and it has fully embraced the faithfulness of God. It has given up trying to get out of the pit in its own strength. It's given up trying to change in its own strength and it's come to the word of God and says, God, this is what you said. And if I'm ever going to be this, it's going to be your Holy Spirit within me that's going to produce this. So I choose to believe you. I'm not going to believe my circumstance. I'm not going to believe my heritage. I'm not going to believe the, the frailty of my own heart. For even if my heart condemns me, the scripture says God is greater than my heart. So I'm not going to believe any of these things. I'm making the choice to believe your word, oh God. And that's what David did. If you go back to Psalm 18, David talked about a time in his life in verse four, he says, where the pangs of death surrounded him, floods of ungodly 
darkness made him afraid. Things around him and within him. The sorrows of Sheol surrounded me. The snares of death confronted me. In my distress, I called upon the Lord and I cried out to my God. And he heard my voice from his temple and my cry came before him even to his ears. Have you ever been in a place like that? Well, you just don't know how you're going to get out. You don't know how you're going to find the strength that you need to go forward. You don't know where you're going to find the love that is required of you in a particular situation or the patience. Where are you going to find the faith to believe for that son or daughter that no matter how much you pray, they seem to be going farther and farther away from God and it's breaking your heart and you're coming into the house of God and you want to worship, but it's so difficult. It seems like hell and all of its distresses are surrounding you. But in verse 27, David says, for you will save the humble people, but you will bring down haughty looks. You will save those who've come into your presence and they say, God, I can't do this in my own strength, but Lord, you can. And so I'm coming in to your presence and I'm casting myself, I'm casting my confidence upon you. I'm not going to try to get out of this by myself. A type of the people of God when they came to the shores of the Red Sea. Behind them is an enemy that's threatening to catch them and devour them. And ahead of them is a place that looks impossible. And eventually, all of us who walk with God come to these places where we say, Lord, I can't go back. I'm going to get killed there. And I can't go forward because I don't have the power to walk through what's ahead of me. And so, Lord, I'm going to trust you. I'm going to trust you because I don't have a plan. I don't have enough strength. I can't pick myself up. I can't do this in my own power. That's why David says, you will save the humble people. For you will lighten my lamp, verse 28. The Lord will enlighten my darkness. For by you I can run against a troop. For by my God I can leap over a wall. And as for for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is proven. He's a shield to all who trust in him. For who is God except the Lord and who is a rock except our God? It is God who arms me with strength. He makes my way perfect. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer and sets me upon my high places. In other words, he gives me the power to climb. David knew he was in a horrible pit. David knew he could never get out in his own strength, but God gave him the power. He teaches my hands to war so that my arms can bend a bow of bronze. You've given me the shield of your salvation Your right hand has held me up and your gentleness has made me great. Verse 36, Psalm 18, you enlarged my path under me so that my feet did not slip. I have pursued my enemies and overtaken them and neither did I turn back again till they were destroyed. I have wounded them so that they could not rise. They're fallen under my feet for you have armed me with strength for the battle. You have subdued under me those who rose up against me. You've also given me the necks of my enemies so that I destroyed those who hated me. They cried out, but there was none to save them, even to the Lord, but he did not answer them. Then I beat them as fine as the dust before the wind, and I cast them out like dirt in the streets. And then David goes on in verse 46. He says, the Lord lives, blessed be my rock. Let the God of my salvation be exalted. It is God who avenges me and subdues the people under me. He delivers me from mine enemies. You also lift me up above those who rise against me. You have delivered me from the violent man. Therefore, I will give thanks to you, O Lord, among the Gentiles and sing praises to your name. In other words, David said, I will praise you among those who don't yet belong to you. I will praise you. You see, Psalm 18 does tie into Psalm 29 and Psalm 40. David saying, God, only you could have done this. Only you could have given me the strength that I have. Only you could have given me the power to not only escape, but turn back and destroy the things that tried to destroy me. I took them by the neck and I cast them into the streets like dirt. And I said to them, you will never reign over my life again. You will never dominate my mind. You will never have my family. You will never take my testimony. You will never steal my song. For God has given me power to tread upon serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt me. 
And I am persuaded that not height nor depth, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come shall be able to separate me from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, my Lord. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Oh, thank God. That's why David starts out Psalm 29 and he says, Give unto the Lord, O you mighty ones. God calls you mighty. Amazing, isn't it? You look at yourself and say, God, are you pointing at the person behind me? Or beside me? That's what Gideon said when the messenger of the Lord appeared to him. And he's, the Midianites are coming in to devour. It's an, it's an enemy army that's coming in to take everything. And sometimes you feel like that. You're trying to live for God and the enemy's coming in and threatening to say, I'm going to take everything. I'm going to take your sanity. I'm going to take your family. I'm going to take your testimony. I'm going to take your song. I'm going to take your ministry. I'm going to take your future. I'm going to take your hope. I'm going to take it all. And that's what the Midian Knights did at an appointed season every year. And the messenger of the Lord came to this young man called Gideon and greeted him. Greetings, mighty man of resources. And Gideon looked at the messenger and said, are you sure? You have the right person. My tribe is the least in all the tribes of Israel. My family is the least in all the families of the least tribe. My father is the least house of all the least families of all the least tribe in Israel. And I'm the least in my father's house who's the least in his family who's the least in the, of, of the least tribe of the least powerful. He was, it's like God went to the bottom and said, here's somebody in a pit. Just like David was in Psalm 40. He says, greetings. Mighty man of resources. How will I do this thing? God said to Gideon, or Gideon said to God, rather, how will I do this thing that you're calling me to do? And the Lord spoke and said, it's because I've sent you, you will do it. You don't need anything else. I've sent you. I've sent you to do something. Do you understand here this morning? Every one of you who know Christ, you've been sent to do something that only God can do through you. You know that. Do you understand that? You're not just an orange pylon in this game for people to run around who are serving God. You're not just a head that fills a seat. You're called to do something that nobody else can do. And you're called to do something that you can't do. Only God can do it through you. Only God, only God can do it. That's why he says, give to the Lord, oh, you mighty ones. Give to the Lord glory and strength. Thank God. In other words, here's what it means in the original. Give to the Lord. Bring honor to him. Let him be esteemed. Let the weight of God be upon you. Let the abundance of God be in you and bring praise to his name. Give him glory. Let God be God in you. Let God carry you. Let God take you. Let God do what he wants to do through your life and worship him in the beauty of holiness. That means worship him in the beauty of bringing to him a trusting heart, a life that is growing in grace, moving forward, by God's power from strength to strength, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Give unto the Lord, O oh, you mighty ones. In other words, come into the house of God. And when you come into the house of God, you're coming in and your worship is now encompassed by a heart that has to acknowledge that God, what you called me to do, only you could be doing through me. Suddenly, I have a realization that there are giftings in my life I didn't have. I'm starting to think thoughts that I never thought before, good thoughts. I'm starting to have faith that was never part of my life. The old things that governed me for so many years, as David said, are now in the dust and they can't rise. They have no power over me anymore. Yes, they yell at me, but they're yelling from the dust. They have no power. And I'm starting to become another person than the person I was. 
before you came into my life. I'm starting to realize that I am indeed a new creation in Christ Jesus. And that you do have a divine plan for my life and nobody else can do what you've called me to do. And I can't do it either. And that's what makes this such a wonderful walk. And when we realize I can't do it either, only God could do this. And so we yield our, our bodies as the writer says in the New Testament, as a living sacrifice to God, which is our reasonable service. That's, that's the beginning of it. We say, God, let your plan be mine. Let your will be my will. Let your strength become my strength. Rise up within me and overshadow my frailties and bring glory to your name. Glory. Do something so powerful in my life. Now, it may not be public, but it will be powerful. The people who know you will know this. The people who walk with you every day, they'll see the difference. Praise be to God. Give to the Lord the glory due to his name. Worship him in the beauty of holiness. Oh God, how am I going to do this? Oh Lord Jesus Christ, you know I want to live for you, but how, how? God says, listen to me. Just listen to me. Open this book and read it and listen to me. Listen to what I'm speaking to you. We're, we serve the one who created the universe by the word of his mouth, who created light and caused darkness to flee at 186,000 miles per second per second. That's how quickly God can do something. That's how powerful his voice is. Psalm 29 says, the voice of the Lord is over the waters. In other words, the voice of the Lord carries us through places that we could never go through in our own strength. The, the God of glory thunders. Remember David said in Psalm 18, when God heard my voice, it says smoke came out of his nostrils. I don't know how he knows that. I guess he had a vision of it. Fire started to shoot out of his mouth. Said he rode upon the wings of a cherub and he came down and he drew me out of these waters that were too strong for me. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The voice of the Lord is over those things that threaten to drown you. The voice of the Lord is over those places where the devil tells you, you can't walk there. You will never make it. You don't have the power. You don't have the strength to do what God's calling you to do. The voice of the Lord is over those waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. Verse five says, the voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. Yea, the Lord splinters the cedars of Lebanon. He makes them skip like a calf and like a young wild ox. In other words, God's voice breaks up the power of the old nature and brings new life. Oh, thank God. Thank God that he does. Thank God that he doesn't leave us to work this out in our own strength. Thank God that he doesn't say, okay, I died for you. You received me as savior. Now give it your best shot to be holy and to do something miraculous and send us out to do what we can't do. Thank God he comes inside of our lives and we begin to change from the inside out. That's the miracle of this relationship with God. And we don't change by human effort. We change by faith in the promises of God that he makes to us. Thank God for that. And the old nature is broken. Ah, you say. But what about the things in the old nature that are so entrenched, they're so enshrined in my character? I don't think they're ever going to go. This is just the way I am. I don't know how change is ever going to come into my life. Verse 5 the voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. Those entrenched things in your life, those things that will try to convince you that you'll never be free. They've just been there so long and the roots are so deep. This is just the way you're going to be for the rest of your life. No chance. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. The voice of the Lord destroys the fear and brings life and brings joy. The voice of the Lord breaks the depression. The voice of the Lord opens the prison doors. The voice of the Lord brings healing where you've been bruised in heart by abuse or abandonment and you think you'll never get over the pain or you've lost a loved one and you think you'll never find a reason to live again. 
The voice of the Lord breaks these deep and entrenched things in the heart. And where it looked like it was hopeless, he makes new life to come forth. That's what God's voice can do. Verse 7, it says, the voice of the Lord divides the flames of fire. He makes a way through temptation and trial. When you don't know if you're ever going to get away from this practice that's in your life, you don't know if you're ever going to be able to break these bonds that want to grip your mind and control you for the rest of your days. It's a trial. It's a difficult trial. It's a hard trial. But the voice of the Lord, the scripture says, divides the flames of fire. He makes a way through what looks like it's going to destroy you. What looks like it has the power to keep you in its grip forever. God gives you the power. His voice, when you begin to listen to him, divides these flames of fire and takes you through to the other side like he did the Hebrew boys. The voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness. Thank God. The voice of the Lord comes to you and I and speaks into these places where it just looks like we've wandered around in this empty, dark place for so long. God, how long am I going to be here? How long, Lord? And the Lord answers and says, just, just the right amount of time. He won't give you to just when it's, when it's right, when the work in the wilderness is finished, people are going to look at you and they're going to say, who is this coming out of the wilderness leaning upon his beloved or her beloved. The voice of the Lord shakes these barren places, these empty places, these places in your life where you're just vacant, you're void. I remember when I came to Christ, I was laying in bed one night and I said to Pastor Teresa, I was weeping and she said, why are you crying? I said, I'm, I'm reading in the Bible about the love of God. God so loved the world. I'm reading in 1 John where if you say you know God and you don't love, there's a huge empty, there's a vacancy in your testimony. I'm reading all of these things about love. And I said to me, it's just a, it's just a, a concept. I don't feel it. I don't feel anything inside. I shut down years ago. I shut down to preserve myself, folks. It was a painful, I haven't necessarily told you the whole story along the childhood years, but I shut down just to preserve myself. It was a difficult, difficult time. And I didn't know how to love. I had to always work for everybody's acceptance. And I remember she spoke to me, and I believe it was God that spoke through my wife to me. She said, when you die, before you die, in your latter years, you're going to be known as a man of such love. That's going to be the hallmark of your life. You're going to be known as a man of love. And I remember, I remember just hearing that spoken to me and yet it was so far off and I was living in this wilderness and I can say like Paul I'm not yet everything that I believe God will make me but I'm way ahead of where I used to be way back then the voice of the Lord shakes these barren places the voice of the Lord speaks life. That's why I said he shakes the wilderness of Kadesh. That must have been a, a particularly dry, barren, hopeless place. And the voice of the Lord makes the deer give birth and strips the forest bare. In other words, God speaks into these empty places in all of our lives and says, you remember when he would meet somebody like Peter in the New Testament, he never speaks to you about what you are. He speaks to you and I about what we will be. He'll come to you and he'll say, this is what you are, but this is not the way I see you. This is what you will be. And he speaks into these empty, dry, barren places in all of our lives. And he brings new hope. And he says he strips the forest bare. In other words, he lays bare and powerless that which told us we could go no farther. It's not just a tree. In this case, it's a forest of trees. It's something so deeply entrenched that there is no way through it but by the power of God. It is a horrible pit, as David called it. It's a place where we can't get out and we can't go through. We cannot possibly see our way through it. I know I'm speaking to somebody here today. But David said the voice of the Lord strips the forests bare. He takes away its power. He takes away its authority. He takes away the curse, the penalty, the power of sin. He takes away the list of everything that was written against us. 
and covers us in his blood. And he declares that we're new. And he declares that the old things have passed away and all things have become new. He declares that by the spirit of God, we are born again as if this former life is over and a new life in God has just begun. He gives us the power to escape everything that told us that we're going to live in the confines of this old life for the rest of our days. He takes us out. He destroys it. He makes a way through the fire. He brings us through the waters. He divides the flames of fire. He shakes the wilderness and strips bare that which stands before us. It says, you can go this far and go no farther. And we begin to change by the spirit of God. We begin to rise up a new people. We are given a song that this world can't give you and this world can't take it away. We are given faith in our voices like the early church in Acts 2 when they came out of the upper room. We begin to speak about the things that God is going to do in our lives that God alone can do. And there's an initial evidence that he has given us the power that these things are going to be accomplished. And people begin to look at us and they begin to wonder, how can this man, how can this woman be saying these things? What church do you go to, my friend? I think I'm going to join you next Sunday. Because there's something coming out of you. There's something in your eye. There's something in your voice. There's something in the way you walk through the room that I know could only come from God. David said, he gave me a new song. A song that people will see and begin to fear and turn and begin to trust in God. And when you and I lay hold of this relationship with God by faith, that's when he says, and in his temple, everyone says glory. In his temple. You and I come into his temple. If we, let, me just, let me just go back and pretend, for example, this is the Old Testament and this is the temple. We know it isn't. We know we are the temple of the Holy Spirit and we just gather in a physical meeting place to glorify God. But in his temple, where he is, everyone says glory. Everyone says, only God could have done this in my life. Everyone says, I'm not what I want to be. I'm not everything that God promised, but I'm not what I was a year ago. I'm not what I was last week. By the grace of God, I'm changing from image to image and glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Yes, I may have suffered 13 defeats last week, but I want a victory. Glory to God, I want a victory. And next week, it'll be 12 defeats and two victories. And the week after, it'll be 11 and three, and then 10 and four, and then nine and five. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. And in his temple does everyone shout glory. Everyone in the church of Jesus Christ should have that inner shout of glory in the presence of God. That inner awareness that I'm changing into the very person that God designed me to be. Not what the world said I am and not what my own heart tells me I will be. But the person that God said I'm going to be. And that person is going to give glory to him. It doesn't matter how much I teach in this pulpit. It doesn't matter how many sermons you hear, how many tapes, how many songs you sing, how many churches you visit. None of it matters if you don't lay hold of the simple truth you've heard this morning. The Christ in me is the hope of glory. And what makes this an exciting life is that he changes us from image to image, glory to glory by the spirit of God. He makes me into what I could never be in my own strength. He takes me where I could never hope to go. He gives me what I could never possess in any amount of human effort. And he puts a song inside of me that brings glory to him and to him alone. In his temple, in his temple, in his temple. I tell you in this church, we're not going to shake, we're not going to sweat, we're not going to run, we're not going to do all this stuff and sway and swoon and bang and clang and shake and sweat. But in this temple, I want to see everyone in this house shouting glory because God is doing something. <laughs> Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Glory to the name of Jesus. 
There will never in this house be gimmicks to try to get you to worship God. Never, 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 as long as this church exists, there will never be gimmicks here. The worship's got to be real or there will be no worship at all. It has to come from inside of us. Because that's where true worship comes from. True worship comes from the man or the woman coming into the presence of God, saying, God, thank you for what you're doing in my life. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. You're setting me free. You're giving me new life. You're giving me victories, yes, and even my defeats. There's even sweetness in my defeats because I'm learning that I have to trust in you more and more every day. And God, as I do, you're not going to disappoint me. You're not going to let me fall. You're not going to let my enemy triumph over me. You're going to give me a song and people will see it and begin to trust in God. <laughs> Glory to the name of Jesus. Glory to the name of Jesus. God help any church that needs gimmicks to get the people to worship. Glory to Jesus. We should be able to stand here with nothing more than a microphone if we even had that. If nobody could get to church on Sunday morning because they're running in the streets, we should be able to stand here and there should be a shout of glory comes from inside of you and I. In his temple, everyone says glory. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, mighty God. Thank you, mighty God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. So we can say like David this morning, I'm not going under, I'm going over. I'm not running away, I'm running towards my enemies. God is going to gird me with strength. He's going to give me power to climb out of these places of despair. He's going to give me the strength to break a bow of steel with my arms. It is God that girds me with strength. It is God that gives me power. It is God that's, who's going to make me everything he's called me to be. And that's going to be my song and that's going to be my testimony. It is God. It is God. It is God. It is only God. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. It is only him. It's only him. It's all him. Everything is about him. Thank you, Lord Jesus Christ. And so I'm going to give an altar call, and here's what I want you to do. I want you to kick the devil right in the face this morning. Just tell him you're not having the last word in my life. You're not the author and finisher of my salvation. God is. God is. God is. God is. God is. You're not taking my family. I put them in the hand of God and God is faithful to keep that which I've surrendered into his hand. You're not taking my song, you're not getting my testimony. As a matter of fact, I'm going to increase more and more by the spirit of the Lord and I'm going to destroy your kingdom. <laughs> Hallelujah. You lay hold of that, my friend, and you watch what God will begin to do. You watch the voice God will begin to give you, the power he'll begin to put in your life. Glory to the name of Jesus. The strength that will come into your heart. Glory to the name of Jesus. I believe in my heart we got one more run in our generation of being the church of Jesus Christ again. We got one more chance, one more invitation, one more opportunity to stand with the glory, the grace of God in our hearts and make a difference in our generation. And if that's the cry of your heart this morning, we're gonna stand in just a moment. This gentleman just couldn't wait to get here. You know, we sing that song, stomp, stomp, stomp the devil or whatever it is. It's got to be more than a song. It's got to be something you let God do through your life. We're going to stomp the devil in our neighborhoods, in our friends, in our families, in our minds, in our hearts, in our lives. We're going with God. We're going with God. And we're going to shout glory in the temple of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's stand together. Let's stand. Just come.
Everyone who needs to be here, God spoke into your heart this morning. Just come. Everyone who's fighting depression, everyone who's discouraged, everyone, everyone who's depressed. That's why the prophet Isaiah called out and said, come, everyone that has no money, come and buy milk and honey without money and without price. Come to the Lord God and receive the victory that he has for you. Let's do that this morning as we worship just for a few moments. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. The only word of encouragement I have for those of you who've come at this altar in uh, North Jersey and at home as well is don't draw back now. You've made the choice to get up and go forward and trust Jesus alone to make you into that person that, that he has destined you to be. Don't draw back. Let God be God in you. I think the devil has a reason to be scared this morning. I really do. You see, all the way, all through history, when you look at it, when God wanted to do something miraculous, he would always look for a barren womb. He would always look for somebody too old to be able to accomplish what he'd called them to do, too young, not powerful enough. And when you look at the testimony of scripture, it's at these moments when there's some people somewhere who realize that only in God will we ever have the strength to do what we're called to do, that he begins to do the miraculous again. The devil's got reason to be scared. The devil's got reason to be scared this morning. Father, let this be a reality. Let this be the beginning of an awakening in this city and surrounding areas, Lord, where Men and women are coming out again. They may have come in distressed, in debt and discontent, but they're coming out mighty in God, coming out willing to let the Holy Spirit take full control, coming out willing to give you glory. No matter how weak we are, we have the creator of the universe living inside of us, and we've come to that understanding. And so, God, we say, bring glory to your name. Bring glory to your name, Lord Jesus Christ. Take us, O oh God, in our weakness and be our strength, be our song, be our testimony, be everything we have to us, O oh God, that we may come back into your house and shout glory every time we come together. There would be a song of praise in us that the unsaved would see and begin to fear and begin to trust in God. Let that be our story, O oh God, in this last moment and we're living in, O oh God. And Father, we thank you for it and we praise you for it with all of our heart in Jesus' mighty and unmatchable name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.